So we don't have time to let Mother Nature, on her own, clean up this mess. It is far too toxic, and the toxins need to be reduced immediately. Dispersants are one of the approved tools or technologies that the federal agencies, and particularly in this case the Coast Guard, uh, has at its disposal for, uh, for use on a spill. The general understanding with dispersants is that it takes oil and disperses it, spreads it out. It's deemed in this accident that some of the products used actually broke the oil down and made it fall like rain through the water column. In addition to the use of booms, absorbents, and skimming operations, the main method that is being used right now to attack the oil spill is by spraying chemicals on top of the oil or injecting them into the water. These chemicals are called dispersants. The dispersant breaks up the oil into small particles so that it is more thoroughly mixed into the water. That does not mean the oil is gone. The dispersant takes the oil off the surface and spreads it throughout the water. As a result, much of the oil sinks to the ocean floor. They're not advisable for use in nearshore environments like in a marsh and so forth because they are toxic, uh, particularly to uh, shrimp and other uh, species uh, in a marsh environment. Oil increases the toxicity to the environment in and of itself. It doesn't make sense to add dispersants, which actually increase the toxicity even more to the environment, which absolutely hinders the ability for living organisms to survive. But if the oil is dispersed in the water column, it's more difficult to gather it. If you, if you want to gather it and get it off the surface and skim it, you've just gotten rid of that. What you've done instead is taken the oil from the surface and dispersed it probably in the upper 100 or 150 feet of the water column. And there's an awful lot of things. And that is the most productive part of the water column. So you've taken this stuff, sorry, but it's toxic, and distributed it through the upper 100 or 150 feet of the water column. Part of the oil and the dispersant also evaporate into the air that we breathe. But we're not told that this substance was being used from what I was told, five times more toxic than the oil itself. What are we doing here? A couple of weeks ago, a scientist put on a dry suit. A dry suit is a suit to go underwater with that prevents any water at all from touching any part of your body. And because of the dispersant in the water, it was so caustic that it started eating through part of the dry suit and actually got inside the suit and in contact with your skin. And per the news report, uh, within by the next day, she started coughing up blood. That's one of the things that this dispersant does, is it actually breaks down red blood cells and causes you to hemorrhage internally. There is an organization called the Earth Organization, which has been working in the Gulf of Mexico to find solutions which would truly resolve the toxic situation. Barbara Wiseman is the international president of the Earth Organization. There is a scientifically proven way to help Mother Nature clean up oil spills and toxins in the environment. It is absolutely effective and it's been around for 30 years. In fact, it's cleaned up thousands of oil spills in over 20 countries. And it just simply does not make sense that it is not being used right now to clean up the Deepwater Horizon spill. And what this technology is called is bioremediation. Bioremediation. Bio means life, and remediation means to remedy. So bioremediation is the name given to methods which use naturally occurring good bacteria, or microbes, that are already found in the environment to remedy or clean up oil spills and other toxic situations. Here's how it works in layman's terms. The planet is covered with microorganisms. You could call them microbes, you can call them bacteria, but the planet is covered with them. Our bodies are covered with them. If you had an oval shaped, you could separate it into three parts. One part would be about 5%, which would be considered bad bugs, basically bad microorganisms. They break things down, they cause things to rot and decay. Can't really call them bad because the fact is we need some of them in a, in a proper balance. Then you have another 5% on the other side of the oval that are 
totally beneficial microorganisms. And these are microorganisms that clean up toxins, they bring life to things, and they are beneficial. And then you have the 90% in the middle that are basically all neutral. And they will follow whichever of the good bugs or the bad bugs that they are primarily in contact with. So if you have primarily bad bugs that they're in contact with, then they will break things down and rot and putrefy. If you have more of the good bugs that they're in contact with, then they'll actually bring life and clean up the area. And you can use this, there's an entire technology based around this natural principle of what Mother Nature does already, except that with the Deepwater Horizon spill, it's going to take decades to centuries to clean this up, truly clean it up letting Mother Nature do it by her own devices. With this technology, you could actually clean it up very quickly, within a matter of a few months. It would make an enormous difference. Using bioremediation or the bacteria is that it, man, it's working right away. It will work at the surface. It will work in the water column. Um, and it, it's eating the material right away. Bioremediation, by the definition alone, was what Mother Nature does itself to clean up toxins in the ecology. So, if bioremediation is such a great solution, why hasn't it been used yet to clean up the deep water horizon blowout in the Gulf? Dispersants have associated levels of toxicity with them. But if you have the option of using something that's less toxic or some other technique, uh, many of which are non-toxic, uh, and you have time, for sure, you want to move with, an, with the non-toxic ones. One of the key reasons why bioremediation is not being used right now is that most people don't know about it and others have old, incorrect, or incomplete information about it. One of the quaint arguments about bioremediation in the salt marsh is this co concern about oxygen. The real argument is getting the oil out of the marsh quickly because it's the oil that is using up the oxygen in a marsh, it's not the microbes themselves. Another very common question people ask are, uh, are these microorganisms going to turn into, you know, monster uh, microorganisms? And that's, a, that's an interesting question because in the real world you have a competitive advantage or you become someone else's meal. And that's what occurs in the microenvironment. But when that oil is gone, uh, those organisms uh, are no longer at a competitive advantage and in fact they're usually at a disadvantage and so they become food uh, for other organisms that are present in the marsh itself. One of the questions about bioremediation that ultimately gets asked is how much does it cost? A uh, cubic yard of material varies anywhere between twenty to fifty dollars a cubic yard. That compares to other kinds of remediation technologies, like incineration, for example, where we're talking anywhere between $300 to $3,000 a cubic yard. So it's very, very cost effective. The Environmental Protection Agency, known as the EPA, is the national agency directly under the president, whose stated mission is to protect human health and to safeguard the natural environment, air, water, and land upon which life depends. I mean, if you, if you want to get a job done, particularly during a crisis, you want to use the best technique available, something that works quick, quickly and effectively and cheaply and has the least impact possible. And that's why these types of techniques really have to be considered seriously. In a federal code which regulates how to handle oil spills, there is a list of products that have already been researched by the EPA and approved to be on that list as products that can be used in the case of an oil spill. There was a procedure for oil spills and in that procedure were a list of approved products for oil spill that could be used in the event that we had an accident on any proportion. There are different categories of products on the NCP list for use in helping to clean up oil spills. The methods that have been chosen for this spill so far are the dispersant, floating booms which attempt to contain the oil or stop the oil from entering an area, skimming operations which work to suck the oil off the surface, and absorbents which attempt to soak up the oil 
and which are then disposed of in landfills. In that was 93, 94 products that were pre-approved, pre-ordained, pre-tested, pre-certified, that in the event that it would need to be used, their needs were there, they could be used. There were 11 bioremediation products on that list when the Deepwater Horizon disaster first happened. I started my research and tried to start vetting products and not knowing the difference. They were broke down between bioremediation products, dispersants, and other chemicals. It was a pleasant surprise to then find out that the Earth Organization had gone through a similar vetting process and completely independent of what I was doing. They had come up with the same conclusion that indeed one product out of all the bioremediation products warranted government agencies, responsible parties, look at a natural bioremediation product or that it emulates mother nature and is utilized in a timely fashion so we can clean up and detoxify the Gulf water. 